Li Hao bags Malaysia's maiden gold medal in Paris. Britain to immediately suspend 30 arms export licenses with Israel. Good afternoon and salam Malaysia Madani. I'm Sahih Samshuddin and you are watching World Today. The Nagara crew resonated in Paris at the Paralympics when national para badminton ace Sheikh Lihao awarded Malaysia its maiden gold medal. Lihao live up to the top seed billing in Paris 2024 by seeing off Suryo Nugroho of Indonesia 21-13, 21-15 in 42 minutes. After the score was long at 3-3 early on in the first set, the world number one seized control and surged ahead, effortlessly building a commanding seven-point lead at 17-10 before sealing the game with a 21-13 victory. The Indonesian who relied solely on his right leash, a powerful smash to secure back-to-back -back Paralympic gold medals with a final score of 21-15. Saya sangat bangga sebab uh, saya pun telah uh, mencitakan sejarah untuk negara Malaysia dan juga diri saya uh, sebagai uh, salah seorang pemain yang telah memenangi dua pingat emas di Sukan Paralimpik, di Sukan Para Badminton berturut-turut. The victory saw the eight-time world champion extend his head-to-head -head record to 14 wins out of 18 matches over Suryo. Li Hao had previously beaten his 29-year-old opponent in their last Group A, a counter by 21-10, 21-13. More sports stories to come in our sports segment. The United Nations, in collaboration with Palestinian health authorities, completed a second day of a campaign to vaccinate 640,000 children in the Gaza Strip on Monday. The vaccination was done amidst Israel and Hamas agreeing to brief pauses in their 11-month war to allow the campaign to go ahead. Louis Waterridge, Senior Communications Officer for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, UNRWA, said there were 87,000 vaccinated on the first day out of 156,000 hoped to be reached. According to the UN, more than 1.2 million vaccine doses have been delivered to Gaza, with an additional 400,000 doses expected soon. UNRWA, the World Health Organization, WHO, the UN Children's Fund, UNICEF and Palestinian health authorities aim to achieve at least 90% vaccination coverage in each round of the campaign to curb the current outbreak and prevent the international spread of polio. While the brief pauses in fighting to bring some relief after weeks of continuous Israeli strikes and fighting between the army and Hamas, Watery said the conflict in other parts of the enclave continued to rage. The WHO said the pauses will likely need to extend to a fourth day and the first round of vaccination will take just under two weeks. Britain will immediately suspend 30 of its 350 arms export licenses with Israel because there is a risk such equipment might be used to commit serious violations of international humanitarian law. Its Foreign Minister David Lamy said on Monday that the decision to suspend the licenses did not amount to a blanket ban or an arms embargo, but only involved those that could be used in the conflict between Israel and Hamas in the Palestinian enclave of Gaza. British exports amount to less than 1% of the total arms Israel receives, and Lamy told Parliament the suspension would not have a material impact on Israel's security. Among the items that will come under the suspension will be components for military aircraft including fighter jets, helicopters and drones. Unlike the US, Britain's government does not give arms directly to Israel but rather issues licenses for companies to sell weapons with input from lawyers on whether they comply with international law. This is not an arms embargo. It targets around 30, approximately 350 licenses to Israel in total for items which could be used in the current conflict in Gaza. The rest will continue. Western Balkan leaders express optimism about EU enlargement for the region on Monday during forums discussing the EU at the Blad Strategic Forum in Slovenia. 
Slovenian President Robert Golub noted the paradigm shift in the EU fund allocations as candidate countries will receive money under the growth plan mechanism pending reforms. Croatian Prime Minister Andrej Plenković and his Albanian counterpart Edi Rama said that Russia's invasion of Ukraine was, for them, the biggest catalyst in accelerating the accession process for Western Balkan countries. The EU plans to use a common growth plan worth 6 billion euros to help the Western Balkan nations aspiring to join the EU, namely Albania, Bosnia, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia. A regional common market is to be formed for integration into the European common market in areas such as the free movement of goods and services, transport and energy. Payments from the 6 billion euro package would be disbursed every six months until 2027 to countries that have implemented the required reforms. Russian President Vladimir Putin arrived in Mongolia for a two-day state visit on Monday. Putin is expected to meet with Mongolia's President Ukhanagin Krolosov and other country officials during his first visit to Mongolia since the year 2019. Russia has been in talks for years about building the pipeline to carry 50 billion cubic meters of natural gas a year from its Yamal region to China via Mongolia. The project, Power Siberia 2, is part of Russia's strategy to compensate for the loss of most of its gas sales in Europe since the start of the Ukraine war. It is the planned successor to an existing pipeline of the same name which already supplies Russian gas to China and is due to reach its planned capacity of 38 billion cubic meters per year in 2025. The new venture has long been bogged down over key issues such as the pricing of the gas. However, Putin said the preparatory work, including feasibility and engineering studies, were proceeding as scheduled. Ukraine urged Mongolia last week to arrest Putin on a warrant issued by the International Criminal Court warrant last year when it accused him of committing a war crime. The Kremlin has dismissed the accusation, saying it is politically motivated. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa told China's Xi Jinping on Monday he wanted to narrow his country's trade deficit with Beijing. The development came days before the Chinese leader is due to urge a summit of 50 African nations to buy more Chinese goods. China, which has the world's second biggest economy, is South Africa's largest trading partner globally. But last year, the value of its imports from China far outstripped exports. Ramaphosa's remark point to the challenge Z may have been convincing African leaders gathering in Beijing to absorb more of the production powerhouses wares. This obstacle is particularly after China did not meet a pledge from the last forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit in 2021 to buy $300 billion of African goods. With Western curbs on Chinese exports such as solar panels and electric vehicles looming, finding buyers for items that the US and Europe maintain, Beijing has overcapacity in is a top priority for Z at this year's summit, which opens tomorrow. Navy and Marine Corps from the United States and South Korea on Monday conducted joint amphibious landing drills off the coast of the eastern city of Pohang to strengthen the alliance combat readiness. More than 40 amphibious assault vehicles, over 40 aircraft and 40 ships, including South Korea's large transport ships, Dokdo and Marado, as well as the U.S. amphibious assault ship USS Boxer, were mobilized. South Korea and the United States have regularly conducted the Sun Yong exercise since 2012 to enhance their defensive posture on the Korean peninsula and improve naval and amphibious capabilities. The South Korean military added that the United Kingdom's commando force is also participating in the exercise for the second consecutive year. Pyongyang has accused the United States and South Korea of rehearsing an invasion with their military exercises. Coming up, seven kill in Philippines after tropical storm Yagi makes landfall. Stay tuned. Violent clashes broke out once more between police and protesters in the city of Ali Purdua in the Indian state of West Bengal on Monday, demanding justice for a trainee doctor who was brutally raped and murdered in Kolkata early August. It was one of several demonstrations by Bharatiya Janata Party BJP, 
workers which have been met with tear gas and water cannons. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's BJP is in opposition in the eastern state and had previously called for a 12-hour statewide protest strike on 28 August. Thousands of doctors, many of them on strike since the crime was discovered also marched in the state's capital of Kolkata. They rallied outside the state police headquarters demanding the resignation of a state police chief of vandalism in hospital and alleged tampering of evidence. The nationwide outrage unleashed by the attack was similar to that which followed the 2012 gang rape of a 23-year-old student on a moving bus in New Delhi. But campaigners said tougher laws had not deterred sexual violence against women. A police volunteer has been arrested for the crime and federal police have taken over its investigation. Meanwhile, over in northeastern India's Manipur state, at least two people were killed after violence erupted on Sunday evening. Fighting between the Métis and Kuki communities began in early May after a court ordered the state government to consider extending special economic benefits reserved for the minority Kuki to the majority Métis. Fighting between the two communities over sharing economic benefits and quotas given to the latter has killed at least 220 people and displaced 60,000 in the last year, with sporadic clashes continuing. Houses were damaged and vehicles were charred, with hundreds deciding to flee due to fear and relocate to relief camps, local media reported. The attack comes after the Cookies recently organised protests against State Chief and Byron Singh after an audio clip went viral in which Singh was allegedly heard making provocative remarks about the community. The state of 3.2 million people is divided into two enclaves, a valley controlled by the Métis and the cookie dominated hills separated by a stretch of no man's land monitored by federal paramilitary forces. The United States on Monday seized a plane used by Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro and flew it from the Dominican Republic to Florida after determining that its purchase violated U.S. sanctions. According to the U.S. Justice Department, the seizure of the aircraft came amid into continuing pressure on Maduro at home and abroad over a contested 28 July election that he claimed to have won, while the opposition said its vote tallies showed its candidate to have soundly defeated him. Maduro, his associates and the OPEC member state's vital oil sector are under heavy U.S. sanctions and his handling of the election has raised the prospects that further measures could be imposed. U.S. Attorney General Mary Garland said in a statement that the Salt Falcon 900EX aircraft was illegally purchased for $13 million through a shell company and smuggled out of the U.S. He said the plane was meant for use by Nicolas Maduro and his cronies. U.S. officials said the seizure, which was first reported by CNN, was carried out working closely with the Dominican Republic. Hong Kong's Cathay Pacific Airways said on Monday that it had started a fleet-wide inspection of its Airbus A350 aircraft as a precautionary measure after it identified an engine component failure in one of its flights. The carrier said it had cancelled 24 return flights operating up until the end of Tuesday and that a number of aircraft would be out of service for several days while the process is being completed. The failure was identified in an aircraft that was forced to return from its flight to Zurich early on Monday. Cathay said the component was the first of its type to suffer such failure on any A350 aircraft worldwide. The company added that it was coordinating with the Hong Kong Civil Aviation Department and the aircraft and engine manufacturer. Cathay operates a mixed fleet of Boeing BAN and Airbus Air PA aircraft and has around 100 planes currently on order, including freighters, narrow bodies and wide bodies, with rights to acquire another 80. Police and military troops to be deployed for Pope Francis' four-day visit to Indonesia were presented in Jakarta as the country step up security measures ahead of the pontiff's arrival. 
The 9,000-strong contingent, which includes elite units from both the military and police as well as presidential security for officers, riot police and K-9 units, will be assigned to security operations throughout the Pope's visit. Pope Francis is due to arrive in Jakarta today on the first leg of the longest trip of his papacy and is scheduled to participate at an interfaith meeting at a mosque in Jakarta. The mosque has an unusual feature, a tunnel connecting it to the city's Catholic cathedral as part of a push for interfaith harmony on his 12-day Asia-Pacific tour. The Pope is also scheduled to meet outgoing President Joko Widodo and hold a mass service at the Jakarta Stadium as part of his visit to Indonesia. He will then leave for Papua New Guinea on 6 September, followed by visits to East Timor and Singapore. One woman has died, schools have been shuttered and tens of thousands of people were without power Monday as wild storms lashed Australia. Police said a 63-year-old woman died after a tree fell on a cabin in the country's southeast. Destructive winds of more than 110 kilometres per hour are lashing the region, leaving about 150,000 people without power. Victorian State Premier Jacinta Allen warned power outages could take up to three days to fix. Meanwhile, coastal areas have been hit by high tides, in some cases swallowing up sand dunes. People have been warned to avoid unnecessary travel, while some schools have closed. The authorities in New South Wales were concerned the damaging winds would increase fire danger on Monday, with many areas on high alert. New South Wales Rural Fire Service Inspector Ben Shepherd warned Sydney and surrounding areas that they would see the worst of the fire danger on Monday, but conditions would ease in the afternoon. Parts of Tasmania have been inundated by flooding and destructive wind, with gusts peaking at 150 km per hour over the weekend. Bureau of Metrology senior forecaster Christy Johnson said a series of cold fronts sweeping across Australia's southeast had caused damaging to destructive wind, but conditions were set to ease today. Floods and a landslide killed seven people in the Philippines on Monday as Tropical Storm Yagi, locally known as Enteng, dumped heavy rain on the capital, Manila and nearby provinces. A disaster agency official said three people were killed, including two schoolboys and a 27-year-old pregnant woman, when a landslide hit two houses in a hilly community in Antipolo, east of Manila. School and government offices across Manila were shut down as a precaution, while ferry services in affected areas were suspended and 29 domestic flights were cancelled. Yagi brought winds of up to 85 km per hour, with gas reaching 105 km per hour as it continued to move northwest of Luzon, the Philippines' biggest and most populous island. The Philippines typically record an average of 20 tropical storms annually, many of those typhoons with landslides among the biggest causes of casualties. Early in July, powerful typhoon Gemi triggered heavy rain and massive flooding in the Philippines, resulting in at least 22 deaths.
Starting off our sports segment this afternoon and still on the Paralympics, another Malaysian para shuttler, Muhammad Faris Anwar, had to settle for the fourth place after losing to Indonesia Deva Anri Musti, 19-21, 12-21 in the men's single SU5 event. Despite leading in the first set, 21-17, Muhammad Faris could not maintain his momentum. Muhammad Faris admitted that he was overwhelmed by intense pressure, which hindered him from showcasing his true potential against Deva, in contrast to his remarkable performance when he emerged as the champion of Group B. Although saddened by not being able to bring home a medal for the country, the world number four is still grateful for the invaluable experience of competing at the highest level. Besides resolving to strengthen his mental resilience moving forward, Muhammad Faris is also determined in to bounce back and win a medal at the 2028 Paralympic Games in Los Angeles. Brazilian swimmer Grabazinho said he felt like a rocket man after he won his third gold medal of the Paris Paralympics on Monday when he raced to victory in the 200 meters freestyle as to a final with another remarkable performance. Moving on to tennis, Daniel Medvedev advanced to the US Open quarterfinals on Monday as he looked to exploit the huge hole left by the shock exits of superstar duo Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz. Medvedev, the 2021 champion in New York art class, Nuno Borges, who was bidding to become the first Portuguese man to make a Grand Slam quarterfinal 6 love, 6-1, 6-3. Medvedev, the only former champion left after the defeats of four-time winner Djokovic and 2022 champion Alcaraz, is in the quarterfinals for the fifth time in six years. The world number five easily down 34th ranked Borges, whose challenge fizzled out under the weight of 51 unforced errors while Medvedev broke serve eight times. Medvedev has won 268 matches on hard court more than anyone else. The run in New York so far has also boosted his chances of qualifying for the season-ending NITO ATP Finals for the sixth consecutive year. The 20-time tour-level champion is currently fourth in the PIF ATP Live Race to Turin and he could jump above Carlos Alcaraz into third by clinching the US Open trophy. In women's draw, Iga Swiatek swept past Lumila Samsonova 6-4-6-1 at Arthur Ashe Stadium to reach the quarterfinals as the top seed continued her flawless run through the flushing Meadows draw. Swiatek, the only former women's champion still standing, has not dropped a set in New York and in her 100 Grand Slam match, the 23-year-old lost only four points on her first serve. Samsonova, the 16th seed, was gunning for her first Grand Slam quarterfinal but never got into the match and failed to set up a single break point against the pool. Samsonova defended two break points in the fourth game but could not hold off the clinical Swiatek, who applied pressure from the baseline to break the Russian to love in the 10th game. Down love three in the second set, Samsonova fought off three break points in the fourth game but then handed Swiatek the break with a double fork. Swiatek closed it out on the second match point with some nimble play at the net before Samsonova sent a backhand out. She will next take on American Jessica Pagula, whom she beat in the quarterfinals two years ago. In football, Uruguay striker Luis Suarez announced on Monday that the upcoming World Cup qualifier against Paraguay will be his last international match. The 37-year-old, who has 142 caps for his country, made his international debut in 2007 and was a key member of the squad that reached the semi-finals of the 2010 World Cup and won the Copa America a year later. Not shy of a controversy while on international duty, Suarez ends a 17th career with the national team as the top scorer with 69 goals. Uruguay hosts Paraguay on Friday at the Santanario Stadium in Montevideo in the South American qualifiers for the 2026 FIFA World Cup before facing Venezuela four days later. Suarez has already said Inter Miami will be his last club after joining the Major League Soccer side last year and reuniting with former Barcelona teammates Lionel Messi, Sergio Busquets and Joel D'Alba. Meanwhile, Galatasaray have opened talks to sign Napoli striker Victor Osimhen on loan. The Turkish Super League club announced on Monday. 
The 25-year-old Nigeria international penned a contract extension with the Italian club last December through to 2026 with a reported release cost of 130 million euros. A month later, Napoli president Aurelio De Laurentiis said Osimhen would leave at the end of the season. The one-away striker, who was recently linked with move to the Saudi Arabian League and Chelsea, has not been included in Napoli's official 23-man Serie A squad for the current campaign. Napoli have been busy building a new team for new coach Antonio Conte. They had brought in seven players to revamp a stale squad, including finally getting Lukaku out of Chelsea. Napoli have also included David Neres, Alessandro Bongiorno, Rafa Marin, Leonardo Spesinozola, Scott McTominay and Billy Gilmore. Osimhen's 26 goal helped Napoli win the Scudetto two seasons ago, but it has all turned sour since. And that wraps up our bulletin this afternoon. In our top story today, Che Lik Hao awards Malaysia its first gold medal in Paris Paralympic Games. Do join us again this evening at 8.30pm on TV1 and Saluran Brita RTM. You can stream us online on RTM Tech's website and mobile app. Till then, I'm Saeed Samshirin, Malaysia Madani, Jiwa Merdeka. Goodbye and thank you for watching.